All right, it's been a little while since we were in the book of Romans. Let me recap quickly for you. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. Chapter 1, good summary here. We are all under the wrath of God, but the gospel is God's power of salvation for all who would believe. Chapter 2, being Jewish or morally good will not save you. Chapter 3, we have all sinned and are unrighteous, but our righteousness can come through faith in Christ. We receive His righteousness. Chapter 4, justification before God comes by faith like Abraham had. God's promise of salvation has always been linked to faith. Chapter 5, we are all condemned in Adam, but peace with God comes through Christ. Chapter 6, we were dead in sin, but now are alive in Christ. And now we are slaves to righteousness by His gift. Chapter 7, we saw the Apostle Paul talk about that the struggle we face in this life against sin is real. The flesh is battling the spirit. You have the old man and the new man battling. This is called sanctification. Chapter 8, which we read from earlier, is the assurance the believer has in Christ. God works all things for our good because of His glorious golden chain of redemption that we read earlier. Chapter 9 shows us God's faithfulness and His freedom to do whatever He wills. And Paul addresses the question, or begins to address the question of Israel. Chapter 10 shows the necessity for Israel and for all people to respond to the gospel message in faith. And chapter 11, we looked at the mystery of Israel and the Gentiles as one tree. And it even talked about the future of the nation of Israel. And that took us to chapter 12, so I will read a few verses before the text we're actually going to be in, but we should cover Romans 12, 9 through 13 today, beginning in verse 1 of Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, which we said that, that therefore had to do with everything that he said from chapters 1 through 11, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And verse 2 is extremely important for us. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to, th to, to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned." For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we though many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. This is where we study the gifts for a while. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now to our text for today. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The Apostle Paul started off chapter 12 and he said, okay, because of all those things from chapters 1 through 11, you need to live your lives in a way that is a living sacrifice to God, and your minds need to be conformed not to this world. They need to be transformed to the renewal of their mind, to the ways of the Spirit, to the ways of God's Word. And then you're going to be able to know the will of God. Many times we're constantly asking, I don't know what God's will is for my life, and we mean by that many times if I should take this job or that job, or if I should buy the red car or the blue car. That's not what God speaks about in His Word when He comes to the will of God. The will of God is things that are good and acceptable and perfect. So after he explains that the Christian should have a new mind, should think differently, he goes straight into in verse 3 where he said, be humble. The Christian should be humble. We should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. 
And then as we're humble, we should look at others and we should think that we're not better than anybody else. And so thus, we should look to serve one another using our spiritual gifts. And then he has this section, which we're going to cover half of it today, where he's going to actually just give just really command after command after command of what the Christian life should look like. Those who are in Christ, you should look different than the world. Do you understand that? There's a problem if people see you and the rest of the world and they go, I really can't tell the difference except they have some little fish on the bumper of their car. That's not a, that's not a good thing, folks. That's not, if that's the only thing they're seeing, that's a problem. And this is one of the most unique places in all the New Testament where Paul just gives uh, exhortation after exhortation or command after command. And so I want to walk through these. If you have the notes, again, it may be helpful for you. Verse 9. Let love be genuine. As I was thinking about that, where does Paul start again with the marks of a true Christian? He starts with love. But notice what he has to put on there. Let love be genuine. That implies that there is a temptation for us to love other people, specifically other Christians, in disingenuous ways. I think we know this though, right? Have you ever ever had somebody who's like, you know that they don't really love you? They may say they love you, and they may do a few things for you, but you can really sense when there's genuine love. It's kind of hard to put your finger on what's exactly wrong there, but you know something's off. We love other people, but when it's not genuine, then generally speaking, that means our motive is wrong. When we're loving other people, and it's not in a, in a genuine way as it should be, then that means we're trying to actually get something out of the relationship. I'm going to love you because I'm going to get something out of this. And make no mistake, that can happen with even those that you actually love genuinely, but you can have seasons where you're disingenuous with your love. You're just trying to get something from them. And the Apostle Paul commands us here to not be hypocrites when it comes to our love. Don't be a hypocrite in the sense of, yeah, you want everybody to love you without any strings attached, but maybe you go to them and you're loving them because you're just trying to get something from them. The Apostle Paul says that's not what a Christian should look like. The work of the Spirit in the Christian's life should be different. So he tells us what we should love, and then right after that, abhor what is evil. And at first when I read that, I was like, well, duh, Paul. Yeah, of course Christians are going to hate evil. And I thought on that a little more. And then I thought about it a little more. And I thought about my own life, my own heart. And then I looked at Facebook. (laughs) And then if you just watch and listen, brothers and sisters, I'm not sure we abhor every evil. We might get most of them. We might get some of them, and we're going to get the ones that certainly we don't struggle with. But I think part of what Paul means here is we should abhor the evil all around us, which, by the way, just so you know, the culture is constantly trying trying to tell you that those things are not really that evil. And if you think you're evil, you're actually evil for thinking that they're evil. Which what they're ultimately saying is that God's word is evil because God's word is what says those things are evil. But even more so, can I say this, that I I think that Paul means look around, we should abhor things that are evil. And guess what, friends? When we sit down to watch particular shows, support particular businesses, support particular politics, there's many times that if we're not careful, we are just following along and supporting evil instead of abhorring it. But I think Paul means something else here too. I'm real quick to go, Christians should love. And you guys, we should abhor what's evil out there. And I think Paul would tell us to turn inward and abhor the sin in our own hearts. I think a lot of times the danger is we will justify our own sin and let it stick around and we don't abhor it. Run from it, try to kill it, but instead we justify it, but we're really good at going, that's bad over there. Woo, that's real bad. But what I'm doing, there's a reason for it. So I think Paul means both. Abhor the evil around us, and that means speaking out against it as well. 
but also the evil inside of us based upon God's word. The next thing he says to do is to hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to what is good. Now what's interesting is just a couple verses back that we've read in chapter, or in chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay, the word of God. We need the word of God, the spirit to work. That by testing, watch this, you may discern again the will of God. What is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we're to hold fast to what is good, but how do you define what's good? You have to go to the word of God. This can't be just some subjective idea that anyone can say, well, I think this is good or I think that's good. No, what this is talking about here is absolute truth that comes from the Word of God. And you need the Word of God and you need the Spirit to be able to even discern what's good. And then, if you get to that point, you've got to hold fast to it. You've got to cling to it. Notice that this is effort. You hold fast to it. That means that we believe what God's Word says is good, and then we seek to apply it by the Spirit to our lives. One thing we're really good at, friends, is having different compartments. Our Christianity compartment, or religious compartment, and then social, perhaps, job, home. And what's interesting is that person might look very different depending on which area they're in. And that's a problem because you belong to Christ and you represent Christ and you're to be a Christ follower in every one of these situations. And the way that we do that is holding fast to what is good, memorizing God's word, reading God's word, believing God's word, asking God's spirit to help me to hold fast to this. There's effort involved. If you just sit back, it's not going to happen. You have to have effort. That's what he's saying. Move on to verse 10 now. Love, goes back to love again. Now he's going to talk about love one another with brotherly affection. Now make no mistake, we are to love the lost, right? Amen? Should we love the lost? Yes. But this letter is to Christians. So Christians should be loving one another with a brotherly affection. So what does that mean? What does that even look like? Well, for those of you who have brothers and sisters, what would it look like to be with them? I think it means that we want the best for them. Do you genuinely want the best for one another? I think many of you do. I'm encouraged when I look out there. But some of you do not. Some of you don't even want the best for your spouse. We should be for them. We should be for one another. Like, in one sense, when it comes to following Christ, this should be like your cheerleading squad. Guys are like, I'm not a cheerleader. Okay, fine. Like you're cheering for your sports team. I don't care, whatever it is. But cheering for one another, behind one another, saying, run after Christ! Go! Philip, go! Ray, go, Miss Jackie! Run after Christ! Being for one another. It's so easy to let petty things come in and not really be for one another, and be against one another, perhaps, or just indifferent. Just don't really care what's going on with each other's lives. You wouldn't hopefully do that in a healthy relationship with your brother or sister. You would stay in contact with them. You would know what's going on. You would talk about things about the family. I love this one. Outdo one another in showing honor. What? What does that even mean, Paul? Paul? How do you show, think about this? How do you even show someone honor? I was trying to think about that. Somebody comes up, another brother or sister in Christ. How do I show them honor, like tangibly? Some things that I came up with, hopefully you can have other ones. Listening to them. I think we honor people by listening to them. If you're somebody that you really don't know much about anybody else, my guess is you talk a lot. And you're not honoring other people. You don't honor their opinions or their perspectives. You just write them off. You don't listen to what they have to say. Do you build them up? And and then watch this. To show honor to somebody, I think it means that we would give them our best. Whatever it is you're giving them, you're giving your best to them. You're trying to outdo them in showing honor. Just think, I just want you to meditate on that this week. 
Every brother or sister in Christ. Oh, Mike's here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go say hi to Mike. How do I show him? I want to outdo Mike in showing him honor. God, what does that even look like? God, te teach me, God. Teach me. Hopefully, you guys can discuss some of these things, and maybe you know more ways than even I do on how to sh outdo one another in showing honor. But notice again, it's intentional. It's not just going to happen. It's intentional. I've shared it with some of you before. When we were in Africa and you would greet one another, when the men in particular would greet one another, you would shake their hands, and the person who had the greatest honor stayed more upright, and those who were younger, generally speaking, or had a little bit less honor, would get lower when you shook hands. But then, if you found somebody who they were trying to outdo you in showing honor, it became this strange thing where you're shaking hands and you're both going lower and lower and lower. <laughs> but it was visible. And you could tell finally, eventually, one of them would grab the other one and make him stand up. You, you deserve the honor. Man, I don't know if we think that way well. I kind of feel like sometimes I come around, I'm like, everyone needs to show me honor. And I think Paul would say that's not the, the way Christians should think. <clears throat> Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. I'm putting those three kind of, kind of together for you. There is a temptation all around you to be lazy or indifferent when it comes to serving the Lord. There's a, there's a temptation to go, well, I'll get there one day. Kind of like when you have chores to do, work to do, eh, I'll get there one day. And then what happens, generally? You don't get to it. And then a problem comes about, and then if you're in my boat, my gracious wife gently reminds me, which I don't understand why she feels like she has to remind me every three months to do something that I was supposed to do, like the next day. Just because I went three months doesn't mean you need to remind me again. I'll get it. She's so good at reminding me in a gracious way. So good at that. But the temptation is to be lazy or indifferent. In particular, when it comes to serving God, do you know why? Back to the compartments. Because, well, if I'm not at the church, then that's the serving God compartment many times for us. But if our mentality is in everything that we're doing, we are serving God, then it's a little easier to be zealous for him because every opportunity and every situation you're thinking, how can I serve the Lord? And you need to do that. Notice what it says. Be fervent in spirit or in the Holy Spirit. There's some question on the translation there. I'm going to say be fervent in spirit, but I think it's linked to the Holy Spirit because that's the only way you're going to be able to serve him anyway. But once again, the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a he, a relationship. So you need to ask him to help you to be fervent. Because there's times I don't feel like serving the Lord. God, help me. Give me a desire to serve you. Verse 12, now watch this. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. How do you rejoice in hope? You can see a lot of these. I just wrote questions. I was just thinking like, Paul, you say do this. How do I rejoice in hope? What, what, what am I hoping in? What thing that hasn't happened yet that you trust or count on? You guys, we hope in stuff all the time. And what the problem is, we put too much hope in those people or those things, and then it doesn't happen, and hope deferred makes the heart sick because those things cannot come through for you every time. Those people cannot come through for you every time. And instead, we should be putting our hope in Christ. Our hope is to be in Christ. So, now watch this. So we rejoice in Christ... And in the fact that we even have hope. Okay, now, why do I say that? Well, because if you take away hope, there's no will to live anymore. You understand that? If you take away people's hope, there's no reason to even live any longer. But for the Christian, no matter what is going on around us, no matter what the narrative is around us, no matter what media is saying, no matter what we are even thinking, the, the, the Word of God, which is true and faithful, tells us that Christ died for us. Tells us that Christ rose for us. Tells us that He's sitting at the right hand and that He's coming to make all things new. 
He's coming back for you, Christian. And so you can hope in that and you can rejoice that the thing that you're hoping in is real. Everything else around you, mm, questionable whether it's real. Questionable what's true. I'm not really sure what's going on. Here's what you can rejoice in. That hope that you have in Christ, the hope that you have in the Scriptures that reveal who God is to you, that is true. And you can rejoice in that hope. And you will never, ever, ever, ever be let down or put to shame. Now something may happen, and you may misinterpret that because you weren't following his word carefully. What do I mean by that? I mean, you could hear from a preacher online who tells you that if you would just have enough faith, your spouse won't die. And then your spouse dies. And then your hope is crushed. That's not what the Scriptures are saying. The Scriptures are saying that you put your hope in Christ, and whether in this life or the next, He will heal. He will do what he says he will do. So there is a, uh, we have to have, again, our minds renewed so we can discern the will of God and know what is good, right, and perfect. And if we do not, then we can misapply things and our hope be shattered. But I promise you this, if your hope is in his word and your hope is in Christ, you'll never be put to shame. But don't take your hope off of him. Don't put your hope in a government, in a spouse, in medical care, in a particular vaccine, or not taking a vaccine, or anything else. Because every one of those things, in one way, or some way, some shape or form, will fail. But Christ will never fail. So put your hope in Him. Rejoice in that hope. Now watch this. Be patient in tribulation. How many of you struggle with patience? <laughs> some of y'all are lying? Well, you're lying. I struggle with patience even when things are going smoothly. I can struggle with patience even when it's going well. Notice what he says. Be patient in tribulation. That's up in the ante a little bit there. Why do we become impatient? And, and, and with whom are we being impatient? Well, ultimately, in tribulation, the Lord. Really, it's the Lord. And so we're becoming impatient because he's not doing things on our timetable. He's not doing it when we think he should do it. And so we get impatient. And oh my goodness, can I just say this? I do not want to hear from any, anyone, anyone else, well, don't pay for, pray for patience. Woo! The Lord will bring something in your life that'll be really hard. Do you know how against the Bible that is with the way we think? It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. So when you say, I don't want patience, you're saying, I don't want the fruit of the Spirit. I, I don't want you to work in my, way, in my life that way, Lord. No, because listen carefully. If we are to be patient in tribulation, who's the most patient, I'll give it away, God-man ever? Who's the only God-man? Was he patient? Yes. Extremely. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Yes. Then you want patience. Yes. And you want whatever it takes to get you there. Ooh. Right there, you all didn't go, yeah, you went. <laughs> whatever it takes, Lord, to make me look more like Jesus. And so, yes, I pray that I would have love, and I pray that I would have joy, and I would have peace, and that I would have patience. And he might say, well, then I'm going to bring something that's going to help you with that. Good, but he's also given me the spirit so I can overcome it. Please, 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 don't fall into the worldly thinking. We need to be patient in our suffering and tribulation. I have a few things I wrote next to that, I believe. Part of the way, at the bottom of the notes there, the part of the way that you can be patient in tribulation is you have to see the purpose in the pain you're facing. You have to see hope in the heartache and certainty in the suffering. You have to believe the promises of God that He says He's working everything for your good and that trials strengthen your faith. If you hold there and hold to those truths that the Scriptures say so your mind's renewed, then you can suffer well. Do you notice that we, pray, we do pray that God would heal and get people out of suffering, but what do we commonly pray for them? That they would suffer well. 
you're going to suffer in this life. Part of that is by, it's by design. You know why? So that you would long for another home. You're not supposed to hold on to this place, guys. We're supposed to long for the home that's to come. And the suffering reminds us of that. And God uses it, as I said before, to pry our fingers off of the things of this world so we would open our hands and glorify Him. Part of the way we're going to be patient in tribulation, but this is just also true other times, is be constant in prayer. And so here's what, here's what I mean. So notice the word constant there. So, so not a box to check in the morning and then never return back to prayer. Some of you guys might be really good at praying in the morning and then, all right, that compartment's done, now I'm going to go on with my day. Others of you do not have an intentional time with the Lord in prayer, but you kind of pray throughout the day. But let me just encourage you real quick that when you say, oh, Lord, help me, most of the time that's not a genuine prayer you're asking there. When you say, Lord, bless his heart, or Lord, bless her heart, you know you ain't praying. If you're from the South, you know what you're doing. You ain't being very kind to that person right then. You're just doing it in a kind of flowery way. Some of, some of you may be visiting from the North and you're like, wait, I hear that all the time. What, what is, yeah, maybe people aren't being as kind to you when they're like, oh, bless your heart. It's not what they mean. Our prayers need to be intentional. We need to have a set-aside time to be with the Lord. You know why? Look at what Jesus, the Lord Jesus, what would he do? He would withdraw and be away with God. And in addition, we need to be praying as we go throughout the day. You can say, Lord, I'm about to meet Mike. I want to outdo him in showing honor. Spirit, help me to do that. Lord, I've got somebody, my, my phone's ringing. I know this is going to be a hard conversation. God, give me wisdom right now. Praying without ceasing idea, but also having time to do both. Okay? Almost done here. Last one, last verse, if you will. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. I love that. Christians' minds should be renewed in such a way that when they look at their stuff, when they look at their money, when they look at their homes, they look at it differently. Because it's not your stuff. It's God's stuff. It's God's money. So you look at things differently. Notice it has saints here. Who are the saints? Question. Who are the saints? Christians. Right? Now, it doesn't mean we don't help others outside of the church. We do. But this is in particular focusing on how we should be loving one another. Contribute to the wants of all the saints. Not the wants. The needs. Some of us need to take some time and figure out what the difference is between a want and a need. And help one another understand that. But notice we're to contribute to the needs of other saints. And then this last one. Seek to show hospitality. Seek to show hospitality. Not if someone happens to come by that you could possibly be hospitable towards, go ahead and do it. That's not what it says. It says seek to show hospitality. And just like some of the other ones, I'd encourage you to think through this. What does this mean? I do think that it has a lot to do with opening up your home and using your stuff to bless other people. I think it has a lot to do with that. It may have some other definitions, but using your boat, using your trailer, using your house to bless other people. Seeking to show hospitality. Why? Again, all this points to Christ. You think God is hospitable with us? His enemies he invites to be children. His enemies, he says, come in and I have a place for you at the table. And we struggle with inviting another brother or sister in Christ into our home because they might see our dirty laundry. You know what I'm talking about. I haven't cleaned as well. We have to think much bigger. Our minds need to be renewed to where we can say amen to all of these. Four things I have for you from this. Go to the Bible to define how you should live. 
Go to the Bible to define how you should live. All these different things that we're talking about, the world's going to tell you other things. You need to go to the Bible to understand this passage and every passage. How do I love well? How do I show honor? How do I serve? Fight not to keep your life in the different compartments. You naturally are going to try to put things in different compartments in your Christianity somewhere else. You're naturally going to want to do that. Fight not to do that. Ask the question, Lord, how do, I, how do I follow Christ in my business? How do I follow Christ at home? How do I follow Christ wherever it is? Ask God to fill you with the Spirit, number three, so that these things will flow out of you. You'll want to love. You'll want to show honor. You'll want to do these things. And realize you must be intentional and not lazy with your Christian walk. It is the work of the Spirit, but you cannot be lazy. Now let me say this before I pray. I am proud of so many of you because as I was reading through the passage, I see you guys. I see many of you doing these things. But I don't think we're doing all of these things, any of us. So we need to continue to grow in it. But be encouraged, the Lord is working. But he can, you cannot do these things unless you know Christ and have trusted in him. So again, if you're here, we would encourage you to cry out for salvation today.